So I'm going to move on and finish up with Ebola in West Africa as a case study. This is a picture of Sheikh Umar Khan, who was one of the leading viral hemorrhagic fever expert in Sierra Leone, and he died of Ebola in July while wearing personal protective equipment and after treating hundreds of patients with Ebola. Um, Ebola is a filovirus which has up to 50 to 90 percent case fatality rate. The natural reservoir is fruit bats, but it also infects primates, chimpanzees, and so on. Um, and it's thought that human outbreaks start when a human being has contact in a forested area with an animal and then contracts the infection, then spreads it, and it's always been in remote rural villages in that context near forested areas. The largest past outbreak was in Uganda in the year 2000, and that was 425 cases, and the outbreak went for three months. The West African outbreak began in Guinea in December 2013 with the Zaire strain, which is the worst strain, the most lethal. It then spread to Liberia and Sierra Leone this year, followed by Nigeria and now Senegal. These are some of the poorest nations in the world. Apparently, there's also an unrelated outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Congo which was formerly Zaire. And there's been almost 3,000 reported cases and about 1,500 reported deaths but there's probably many, many more, more than double unreported cases. Many of these people are in home quarantine. They're not even getting to healthcare systems. They're not being diagnosed. There's been documented 240 healthcare workers infected and um, over 150 healthcare workers who have died. This is an unprecedented outbreak because it's the first time Ebola has been documented in West Africa. It's the first time it's occurred in more than one country simultaneously. It's the first time it's occurred in capital cities. There's been shown a high genetic mutation rate, and um, there's a study published in Science last week suggests that the, the outbreak strain has emerged from an ancestor, a common ancestor, um, in two, the year 2004, which means, how did it emerge? You know, has it been circulating undetected in West Africa for 10 years? So the WHO, CDC, and Australia, and many other countries, recommend surgical masks for healthcare workers treating Ebola patients. They simultaneously recommend respirators for laboratory workers handling Ebola. Ebola is predominantly spread by contact with blood and bodily fluids. There is some uncertainty about other modes, including airborne. Transmission isn't fully understood for many infections, and no infection is strictly unimodal. Spread can usually occur by multiple modes, and the relative contribution of each mode is very difficult to quantify. Well, what do we know about Ebola transmission? Well, it's a rare disease compared to influenza. It's much less well studied. We accept that direct contact is the main mode of spread. But the epidemic pattern of this epidemic suggests that other modes are possible. Many healthcare workers who've been using full PPE have died of Ebola. Several animal studies suggest that transmission can occur by non-contact modes, such as airborne droplet. And there was an outbreak in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which resulted in Five of 19 infections in people who visited an Ebola patient but did not have any direct contact, which again suggests there are other modes of contact of transmission. So let's go back to the clinical setting. You know, we know that there's widespread unrest around the world about how the health, among healthcare workers about these guidelines. You know, I mean, email correspondence with people all over the world who are highly agitated about these guidelines. There is this basic inconsistency between the guidelines for lab workers and healthcare workers. Medicine Sans Frontiers recommends a respirator, and as of September the 1st, no MSF worker has been infected. In contrast, WHO workers have contracted Ebola. Ebola transmission in high-risk settings and high-risk procedures is not well studied. And there's certainly evidence from other infections that aerosol spread can occur with, without aerosol-generating procedures. So, the lab is a highly controlled, sterile environment. The hospital ward is unpredictable, uncontrolled, um, a highly changeable, dynamic environment. It is much more dangerous, much more contaminated than a laboratory. So why on earth would you recommend a respirator for a lab worker and tell the nurse, you can just wear a surgical mask? What should we base guidelines on? Yes, we should base them on modes of transmission, obviously. But we should also look at uncertainty around modes of transmission. And we should look at case fatality. So if there's uncertainty for a virus that kills up to 90% of people, that should be considered. It's very different from making the same recommendation for flu, where the death rate is less than 1%. 
You're really playing Russian roulette with the frontline healthcare workers' lives if you get it wrong. We need consistency. Why should lab workers have one guideline and healthcare workers another? We need to look at, are there any vac proven vaccines or treatments for this disease? And if there isn't, it becomes even more important to make conservative recommendations with PPE. We need to look at the immune status and comorbidity of healthcare workers. In developed countries, for example, the health workforce is ageing. Most of our nurses and doctors are older. They have chronic diseases. This may make them more susceptible. And we need to look at observations in the field. Healthcare workers are dying of Ebola. There's been no clinical trials of PPE in Ebola. The only trials we've got to go on are the four published trials I mentioned. And as I said, our trials show that N95s but not surgical masks have efficacy for where the majority of viruses isolated were not predominantly spread by the airborne route. So it's not really about aerosol versus airborne. It's not about glass boxes. It's about protection in the clinical setting and the proof is in the pudding. If you've got a clinical trial that shows protection, it doesn't matter what the route of transmission was or how many, what percentage was this or that. It's irrelevant. It's just an academic debate. You just go on the clinical efficacy data. So, and I think in making guidelines, we need to use the precautionary principles. So a disease with a high case fatality rate, no proven vaccine or treatment, with uncertainty around the transmission mode, then we should err on the side of caution. The occupational health and safety of healthcare workers need to be the foremost concern. If our health care workers die and our um, health system falls apart, we've got no hope of controlling the outbreak. Meanwhile, there's been no criticism publicly of the CDC or WHO guidelines, but lots of um, commentaries um, supporting their, their, their statements. This one was, the first one there was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Um, I'll draw your attention to that. The first bit actually relates to something Graham said about malaria cases. The only point I'll make is that in an outbreak setting, the positive predictive value of a clinical defi case definition rises to a very high level. So if you know there's an Ebola outbreak going, the chance of a febrile patient being having Ebola is much higher than in a non-outbreak setting. Um, this last line, more insidiously, requiring precautions that exceed the CDC's recommendations fans a culture of mistrust and cynicism about our nation's public health agency. Well, you know, you've got to ask yourself, what's more important, the reputation of the CDC or the lives of the healthcare workers? The second commentary came out in Lancet on the weekend. They go as far as saying, in fact, goggles and masks might not even be necessary to speak with a conscious Ebola patient, as long as a distance of one to two metres is maintained. Well, which is it? One or two metres? You know, the reason it says one to two metres is because it's based on very sparse data and, you know, no one knows. Why would we be playing Russian roulette with, with healthcare workers? Now, I looked for some cartoons yesterday on the web to try and illustrate my sense of um, deep concern about these guidelines, and I couldn't find any, so I drew my own. <laughs> Good news, you'll be protected with surgical masks. But the lab workers get a respirator for Ebola. And you can see I've also made a comment here about race and equity. Don't panic so much. There's a lot of statements out there about not panicking. Let's not make people panic. Well, to me, there's just cause to be panicked. You may not even need a mask to talk to an Ebola patient. Just use this tape measure. Keep one to two metres between you and the patient. Not sure which, one or two. You choose. And keep still. But ask the patient to keep still too. I mean, you know, whoever said this has obviously has no concept of what the clinical setting is like. You know, if the patient has a cardiac arrest, do you just say, sorry, I've got to stay two metres away from you? So, in summary, you know, to make guidelines, we need to think of a risk analysis framework. It is not just about the mode of transmission. That's just one factor that needs to be considered. You need to think of your occupational health and safety obligations to the, to the healthcare worker. You need to think of disease severity and case fatality. Uncertainty is very important to consider. If there's uncertainty and 90% of people die, well, you've got to use the precautionary principle. You need to think of um, availability of other treatments or vaccines. For influenza, there's antivirals and, and vaccines. There's nothing for Ebola that's proven. And you need to look at equity and consistency with other recommendations. Cost and logistics um, may influence implementation of policy, but they shouldn't influence best practice guidelines. So yesterday, MSF actually expressed no confidence in WHO. 
the international president of MSF said, uh, made these statements. Um, I'll just read out the last bit. The WHO announcement on August the 8th that the epidemic constituted a public health emergency of international concern has not led to decisive action and states have been essentially joined a global coalition of inaction. She said the clock is ticking and Ebola is winning. The time for meetings and plannings is over. It's now time to act. Every day of inaction means more deaths and the slow collapse of societies. An MSF call for urgent military intervention and for WHO to pull out. Science is not always convenient. Perception and popular views are not always the truth. And disasters breed epidemics of exploitation. Um, I'll just mention that the science study that looked at the phylogeny and genetic um, uh, epidemiology of, of the current outbreak, six of the 57 authors on that paper um, died and five of them died of Ebola. And of course, they were all um, African authors. The one in the centre there is Dr. Sheikh Gumar Khan, who was a leading viral hemorrhagic fever expert. Words issued by instruments of power should not be blindly followed. They should be reviewed critically, and if they don't seem right, we need to question them. I just want to remind you about the price you pay, the human price, when you don't speak up, when you don't question things, with the case of Vioxx. That was a non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. There was a large industry RCT published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And for those of you who think if it's published in the New England Journal, it must be true, this is a good example that is not the case. It showed a fourfold increase in acute myocardial infarction in the intervention group compared to naproxen. The authors interpreted this as a protective effect of naproxen. This was accepted by the editors and the reviewers. Another case of the Emperor's New Clothes when there was absolutely no... It also, for that to have been true, um, naproxen would have had to be much more effective than aspirin in preventing acute myocardial infarction, and there was absolutely not a shred of data to show that this was the case. There was a conspiracy of silence around this. Many people died from Vioxx of acute myocardial infarction, and uh, there's now a, still ongoing, I believe, a massive class action uh, against the manufacturer. It was eventually retracted and withdrawn and, you know, um, everyone kind of accepted the truth that this was a dangerous drug, but there was a conspiracy of silence at the beginning. I'd like to acknowledge um, a range of people who've worked on the mass trials and also on some of the Ebola projects we're doing, but particularly Walton Beckley and Mohamed Jallo, who are healthcare workers from Sierra Leone, who are studying here at UNSW, who've given me a perspective, a really um, useful and valuable perspective on the outbreak in West Africa, which is a refreshing change from the cultural imperialism that we are bombarded with every day about this outbreak. Thank you.